so as, as I mentioned, we're very happy to have four great thinkers really think through and help us think about the legacy of Eyes on the Prize. And um, I'll start with John Else. As I mentioned, John is the author of True South. He was a series producer and cinematographer on Eyes on the Prize One. Uh, he's also an accomplished filmmaker and a former director of the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley. Welcome, John Else. Um, to his left is Sabah Folayan. Uh, she is an activist and a filmmaker. Her um, featured debut film, Who Streets, uh, which chronicles the activation of communities in Ferguson after the Ferguson uprising, um, just made its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival last month. So welcome, Sabah. Thank you. Um, all the way at the end, Sam Pollard. Sam is a director producer and an editor. Uh, he was the director of two episodes in Eyes and the Prize 2, uh, including one that we'll see this afternoon. And this is actually going to be the episode that concludes our showcase. And it's the episode titled, Ain't Gonna Shuffle No More. And it's, uh, um, it chronicles the emergence of Muhammad Ali alongside the student movement at Howard University and the gathering of the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana. And Sam has a long history. We could talk about him for a long time, but he uh, is the director of many films, including Slavery by Another Name and August Wilson, um, The Ground on Which I Stand, and he's also well known for his collaborations with Spike Lee. Please welcome Sam Pollard. <laughs> and we're very happy to have moderating this conversation, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole is a, an investigative reporter with the New York Times and has written extensively on race and civil rights. So please, I'm gonna turn this over to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. I'm just gonna get right into it. Um, I think clearly the films in the Eyes on the Prize series tell us about where we came from. But I think as we know now from your filmmaking, uh, Sabah, but also from the last election, that these films aren't just telling us from whence we came, but where we still are. Um, and I think one, that's, that's the magic of the way that you all did the film, but also speaks to clearly how little progress or how progress has to constantly, we have to fight to maintain that pride. So I think, um, the first question I'm curious though, I actually wanna talk before we get into politics a bit about uh, filmmaking. Um, I'm very interested in how did each of you understand that you could be filmmakers? And then how did you actually become filmmakers? Whoever wants to take that first. <laughs> well, um, you know, I mean, I, I came of age in the 1960s, and you get a lot of slack if you came of age in the 1960s. I actually came out of activism, came out actually out of the, the classic civil rights uh, movement. <clears throat> and um, I got interested in still photography during um, the, you know, during the war in Vietnam. I tried to be a still, I tried to be a news photographer. I tried to be a still photographer covering a lot of that domestic violence around the war. Uh, and I didn't have the stomach for it. I just, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't place myself between the police and the demonstrators and keep my wits about me. So in desperation, I took a job um, processing educational films in a film lab. Um, and it was an amazing education because I was young. I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. And all of a sudden, it was my job to watch the same educational film over a hundred or two hundred times. Um, and that was an enforced education that was, that was worth its weight in gold. One thing led to another. Uh, I ended up going to film school. Um, I started out actually heading toward feature filmmaking, toward narrative filmmaking. And after my second or third low budget B grade, C grade, D grade, um, you know, low budget feature, I just to say, you gotta be crazy to spend your life doing this, where you're just doing take after take after take of the same stupid line of dialogue. Um, and why not do nonfiction? And once, uh, once I got involved with documentary, there was no turning back, and I've been doing it for, I don't know, 40 years now, something like that. Nothing like nonfiction. I agree. <laughs> Um, I sort of came, uh, came into it in a different way. It was the early 70s, and I was uh, studying at um, Peru College. I was looking to a business career, and I was not happy. And I got into a film and television workshop at the public television station, WNET. It was a one-year program. They taught you how to shoot and how to edit. 
and how to write scripts. And I gravitated to the editing. So at the end of the year, I got a job as an apprentice editor on a low-budget feature film titled Ganja and Hess, directed by Bill Gunn. And the editor of that film took a liking to me, and I became his assistant for the next three years. And he, from that feature film, he was editing documentaries, which I didn't really know much about, because I loved feature films, narrative films. And like John, I thought I wanted to edit feature films. But he sort of got me into documentaries, and I fell in love with nonfiction films and loved the idea that you made the films, the documentaries, in the editing room. And that was the beginning. And like John, I've been in it a long time. But how did you go from someone interested in business to actually thinking, I want to take a class on film or I want to learn how to do film? I was, I was reluctant at first because I loved movies even before. You know, I was, I was one of those people who used to go home and there used to be a magazine, John remembers, TV Guide. And I would go to the TV Guide when I was 14, 15, and I would mark off all the movies I wanted to see. And I would just, when they came on, I would watch them. So I loved movies. But when this teacher of mine at Peru College told me about this film and television workshop and that you could get a job in the film and television business, I said, my reaction was, well, I like it, but I don't care about how you make these things. You know, so I was reluctant. But as soon as I, that first thing we shot, uh, and then the first night I was in the editing room working on a movieola and, yeah. and the rewinds, it was like magic for me. And I was like, I was, I was in the zone, and I wanted to do it <laughs> from that point on. Okay, and how about you? Um, I know what the TV guide is. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, first of all, I'm just really, really honored to be sitting here with both of you who have just so much respect and admiration for your work, and um, you know, just, yeah, that's awesome. I was, two years ago, three years ago, I guess, I was kind of, in a soul searching process. I had just taken the MCAT and I was on the path to medical school and I was having that kind of internal sense of dread about what I was about to step into and I just couldn't, you know, I just couldn't find that, that spark. My older brother is also, um, he's now a doctor and he was doing the same path but just having all this fulfillment and I wasn't getting that. So I started to explore different avenues thinking that, you know, I would have this, this as a backup plan and see if I could find something. And um, I started to become vocal on social media, honestly. And people were responding to it, responding to me, messaging me privately, um, coming up to me in person, and resonating with the things that I was writing. So um, when Mike Brown was killed, August 9th, 2014, in Ferguson, I just felt like I had to go and be there and somehow be with the people who were there because I, had, I didn't see or know anybody else who was really you know, getting physically involved and trying to intervene in what was going on. So I went there and I was like, you know, how can I make myself useful? So my background was medicine and by this time I had, or you know, pre-med and by this time I had some experience with nonprofits and kind of the social work field, so that was what I knew. So I said, I think there's a public health risk associated with people and police facing off like this every day. There's a PTSD that can, that can come out of that. And so I wanted to kind of uh, find the grounds to do some deeper research and, and try to problem solve around that. So I get there and I have my little you know, questionnaire and it's like, have you been feeling irritable, depressed? How is your sleep? And I'm looking around me and it's just total chaos everywhere. And I'm like, well, this is not gonna work. So. <laughs> I was with my friend from college, and he was a still photographer. He had just started working in um, cinematography. He's a field producer with Revolt. And at first, he started taking photos, and I started writing. And that had been kind of like my secret passion, but I just something that I did for myself. And the first article that I wrote was something terrible, like five things you need to know about Ferguson or something. And I just, you know, yeah. And so I just couldn't, it wasn't enough. It wasn't containing what I was seeing in front of me. And so we kind of naturally started rolling and I started asking questions. And after the first interview we did, which is actually the opening scene of the film, we went back to the house we were staying in and we just were up until like five o'clock in the morning, just alive with energy about what this story was gonna be and all the things we were gonna do. And we didn't know it was a feature film then. We're like, we can have a whole channel and it'll be a series and we'll be the news and we'll, but you know, just kind of that, that spark, that click happened really organically. And, and ever since then, 
you know, this has been the only thing that it takes so much to make these films and do this work, and you touch on it in your book. It's so, it's, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs, but I still, every day, I feel like I have the same energy. I can, you know, keep going, keep going. So that's how I kind of knew that this was gonna be for me. I mean, that is like mind boggling to me, that you could like be on your way to medical school, go to Ferguson, and then say, I think I'm gonna make a film, and then make a film, like how, how does that actually, like, how does that happen? How does it go from, I mean, a lot of people have thoughts about it would be cool to do this or maybe I should, but you've actually done that. How, how did that happen? Um, I mean, it's all of those cliche things. It's speaking it into existence. It's believing in it. It's, it's you know, a community of people believing in it, though, not just me believing in it, but this whole documentary community, the Ford Foundation and all of the MacArthur, Tribeca, Sundance, a whole list of foundation. I mean, our thank you page is, you know, <laughs> three minutes long. Um, and so it just was, people felt the energy of what we were trying to do, I think, and we were really, really committed to trying to uh, be of service to the people there who were trying to get justice and to the larger population who needed to understand this on a deeper level. And we just wanted to kind of remove some of the sensationalism from it and get to the humanity of what was going on. And I think that because people believed in that, you know, there was so much support and momentum around it that for me and my co-director Damon, we just kind of had to like surrender to this process and just come and give our best to it and kind of let it happen. I mean, you know, it was really, really hard work, but I definitely can't take all of the credit because it took a lot of people and a lot of faith for it to, to come out. So I was maybe 10 or 11 when Eyes on the Prize aired the first part of it. And um, I always loved history. And I, I remember sitting there and just being astounded by all of this history that I didn't know. Um, because one, by 10, you aren't taught a lot. You know who Dr. King is. And then the way you're taught it is Dr. King has his dream and then the dream comes true and we're kind of done with that. Um, but clearly, I was, I mean, I was living in a segregated community. I was being bused to white school, so I knew that that wasn't the end. And, and, and it was um, remarkably affirming to see this history being told, not in a little snippet, but really in depth. And I wonder, how did you guys specifically come to make this? How did you come to make Eyes on the Prize? How did that happen? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it all, it's all about Henry Hampton, um, who died way too young, almost 20 years ago. Henry Hampton was a young uh, African-American medical student, actually, interestingly enough, uh, from St. Louis. He grew up in, in segregated St. Louis. Um, and in uh, 1955, he was profoundly influenced and affected uh, by the death of Emmett Till mm. uh, and the photo in Jet Magazine. Uh, that was the same year that he was stricken with polio, actually. Um, and for the first time in his life really began to, I think, understand <coughs> what that disability uh, was. So he sort of tucked away in the back of his mind this idea of someday <coughs> doing something about civil rights. Um, he, he had a long and really interesting early career, including working for the Unitarian Church. And when he was working for the church, he got uh, sent to Selma, Alabama, and was in one of the marches in Selma, not the big Bloody Sunday march, but <clears throat> the next one, the so-called turnaround march, which was this really complicated, tactically weird march where they did the right thing for the wrong reasons or the wrong thing for the right reasons and retreated. And, um, anyhow, he was walking back across the Pettus Bridge away from the troopers, and he looked around and saw all these news cameras, uh, and he thought, someday someone's gonna make a great story out of this. Uh, and sure enough, he tried about 10 years later, he tried to do um, a big epic, a 26-part epic, actually, about <coughs> civil rights for commercial television, for ABC television. Did you say 26 parts? 26. Wow. Yeah, 26 parts. Well, he was naive. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, it's like half and a year. That first attempt was a complete train wreck. It was a humiliating failure, partly because Henry would be the first to admit he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and also, at that time, this was 1978, no one had figured out how to do these big, complex historical series. Uh, you know, it was way before Ken Burns, it was way before these PBS, it was, the History Channel didn't exist, 
you know, the American experience didn't exist, so no one really knew how to do it. Anyhow, long story short, um, he was determined not to give up, and about four years later, he, he relaunched the project in the public sphere, you know, with help, I have to say, from the Ford Foundation, was the first early big funder to come in, MacArthur, all the, our friends. Um, uh, it had, I have to shout out today, it had funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, significant funding. Um, and he hired me and Sam and a whole bunch of folks um, who had some experience and we set off and, you know, over the next two years we made First Eyes One, which was the six films from sort of the classic black and white, in all senses, a black and white <coughs> civil rights movement and then went on to do Eyes Two, which was another, what, eight shows, yeah, right. Um, and here we are. I can't believe we're... 30 years later, we're sitting here in Brooklyn in a screening room looking at these things with a young filmmaker who's, who's carrying on the work. I mean, it's just sort of, it's astonishingly wonderful for me, frankly. Did you want to add anything to that? Well, I was fortunate enough to come in on Eyes too. I had been editing for about 12 years and uh, I was working on a show and I had an assistant, Meredith Woods, yeah, Meredith. who had worked on Eyes and she suggest, she had said to me that uh, Henry was looking for a producer for Eyes 2. They had lost a producer, and I, she gave me the number. I called up Henry. I went up to Boston, had an interview with Henry, and signed on to be one of the producers, one of the salt and pepper teams. Salt and pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes 2. But what I mean by that is that every team, of, we all did two shows, these salt and pepper teams. There was one white producer and one black producer. And it was, it, was, it was Henry's mindset to sort of create that tension, which definitely did happen. <laughs> that actually is a great segue, because my next question is exactly that, and I'd like all three of you to answer. Um, I mean, these films, Who Streets, Eyes on the Prize, are dealing with the black fight for full humanity and full citizenship in this country. And I wonder how important is the race of the director and the producer when you're making a film about this? this particularly about the black struggle, struggle for full citizenship? I would like you all well, to answer. I'll, I'll, I'll dive right in. There were, um, there were very strong arguments within Eyes on the Prize that it would make an incredible statement if it was an all-black production team. Judy Richardson really fought for that. Um, and Henry felt, uh, Henry Hampton <clears throat> felt um, that, you know, if you're going to make these films that are about white people and black people in America, that to reach a white and black audience, and he was really determined that he was going to reach a mainstream middle American audience in Iowa. I'm sorry, for those who don't know, was Henry Hampton white or black? Oh, I'm, oh interesting. Oh, wow. Henry Hampton was black. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Henry Hampton, when he had been an activist, he had been... Uh, um, and so he, as Sam explained, he felt that it was really important if you're going to going to work these things out in society and you're going to work them out in films, you have to work them out in the editing room also. These, he said, we have secrets from one another. We have secrets across race. We have secrets across generations. We have secrets across genders. And it became known around Blackside as the abrasion of good minds. And, and he, wanted, he wanted people to, to fight it out in the editing room. You know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, I think in the end, it probably made Eyes on the Prize more accessible to a broad audience, frankly. Is Eyes on the Prize as strong as it might have been had it been an all-black production team? Maybe not. Maybe not. Well, I, I would jump in and say, I think, you know, it was Henry's vision. And I, I, even though Judy was, was really strong about all-black teams, Henry's vision was to have this kind of tension. And it wouldn't be the eyes on the prize it is without that, you know. It was hard, you know, because there would be times when, you know, the, of the co-producing teams, we would have different opinions and it would get, it would really get tough. One of the things though that, if you remember, John, one of the things that was important that, we always had this discussion that when we went out to interview people, oh, who yeah. would interview who? If it was a white person, should, should I interview that person? Or should Sheila Bernard, who was my co-producer, interview that person? We always had that constant dialogue, you know, and at that time, if it was the white person, Sheila would do it. If it was the black person, I would do it. Now, quite honestly, I've interviewed lots of white people now from the South since then. 
So I don't really have a problem with it. But back then, we had that sort of tension, yeah. the constant tension. And John's right. There were some teams that didn't survive, <laughs> that didn't survive the salt and pepper thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if y'all want to tell any particular story. I know I'm a little interested in the tension. Um, but I think that would be, right? I mean, if you're looking about what it is that you were trying to do and uh, understanding that black and white folks live a fundamentally different lived experience in this country, there would have to be tension, um, even though the film was about distinctly, I mean, it, it was also about white America, like, being anti-democratic, right? And it was both, both of those things. But is there anything that, that sticks out in your, your head, a particular tension or a particular struggle over a particular issue or framing in any of these? Well, it's interesting. Well, two things. First of all, I have to say, we did some interviews with an all-white crew and some interviews with an all-black crew. Very, very seldom. But occasionally, we would have that discussion back in Boston and decide to have a crew that was all one race. Well, it's interesting. Orlando Bagwell and I, <clears throat> Orlando's a black producer. Um, who did two of the episodes and I was one. Orlando and I were rooming together in Boston and we were both raising young sons at the time. Um, our sons were, I think, about, both about 10 at the time. And it was, the thing I remember actually had, did not have to do with the film, but it had to do with Orlando and I talking about raising our sons. And the talk that he would have with his son, the talk that I would probably not have with my son, there was a different talk that I would have with my son. Uh, and so th that, those were probably discussions that I think we might not have had had it not been that the building was this, <laughs> it was like this multicultural, multi-ethnic. Boiling cauldron. Pardon me? Boiling cauldron. Boiling cauldron of multiculturalism. Yeah. 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 So, I'm, I mean, definitely, at least to me, when I watched your film, I knew that this was a film made by a black person. Um, so what do you think is the role or importance of the race of the, the producer or the director when it comes to these films? Um, I think that it's really important that this film needed to be authored and owned by black people. And I think that for my co-director and I, um, it was really important to both of us that a woman helmed this film. And I think that there's a certain um, sensitivity that you bring as a ma marginalized person because in order to survive you have to understand the distance between yourself and the other whereas if you are not you know marginalized in a particular way you don't necessarily have to pay attention to th certain things because it doesn't you know bear on your security in, in different ways so I think it was important for that direction to be there and that ownership to be there but at the same time you know my edit my editor is a wonderful white guy and he you know, brought a whole lot of insight to the film and the issues that we were grappling with. And he brought, he brought, you know, a level of distance that was really, really necessary because when you live through this and, you know, like John and like Henry, I was an activist. I came to it trying to be a part of it. So I was standing shoulder to shoulder with people. With people. Um, and sometimes you don't, you don't have that perspective. You just don't. There were points in the process where we had to bring in a totally outside voice who was white, who could just look at our footage and find pieces of information because we literally could not tell what contextual facts were relevant because we knew this story so well. So I think ultimately we are more, we are better together. We are better when we're working together in diverse groups and bringing our different talents and, and you know, strengths to the table. But I think it's also really, really important to acknowledge that, you know, not just in storytelling, but in a lot of realms, it is time for black leadership. It is time for the leadership of women. It is time for the leadership of people of color because we're, if we don't get that, we're missing a perspective. We're never gonna have the full picture without, you know, having that leadership and the ability when the buck stops, you know, somebody who is deeply vested and somebody who understands from the perspective of a black person can make that call. I think that was really, really important in our film. I wanted to ask you, um, when, when you guys made Eyes on the Prize, there was some distance, but you're making this film while it is happening, while the movement is ongoing. And what are the particular challenges to, to cr trying to create a uh, film that is documenting a movement that is st still happening? Yeah, almost all of it was a particular challenge. Um, <laughs> it, you know, we started out wanting to, uh, you know, make we thinking we were going to make something longer. You know, no, we did. We had no idea how we were going to fully contain this story, 
And it's actually funny because Sam, at different point, points in the process, has kind of given us feedback on our works in progress. I remember when we first got ready to send you some footage, we're like, yeah, so we have an assembly. It's 14 hours long. <laughs> And Sam emails me back and he goes, what are you making a three-part series? Get back to me when you have an assembly. And, you know, but it was great motivation for us to kind of understand that we were, we were going to need to make some difficult choices and fast if we were going to be able to do this. Um, you know, and that's towards the end of the process. But as we were filming, um, I think because of things like Eyes on the Prize, we kind of had this innate awareness that the things that were happening around us had a historical value in and of themselves. And so um, it, it kind of gave us permission to just explore. And I think, you know, again, thanking the, the documentary film community and the funders who supported us going out there, you know, we would come back with tidbits of footage and we're like, listen, like there is a story here and we're working through it, you know, and they kept sending us back and we were collecting. Stuff. So ultimately we had, you know, three to 400 hours worth of footage and there are, there's material that, you know, I think has an archival value to it. And we kind of knew that as we're collecting it. So, you know, like Sam said, documentaries are made in the edit. So when we got finally finished shooting, I think the things that we knew were that this was going to be a personal story first and foremost, and that, that, you know, the protests and the things that people already knew, at least knew a little bit about Ferguson, that had to be the backdrop to the story about what it's like to be a human being in the situation. We knew that. Um, we knew that it was going to be an ensemble cast. We weren't trying to create any monolithic heroes. And I think, you know, I think that's one of the great things, again, about Eyes on the Prize and the fact that you took so much time and space to tell the story is that you, you get the sense that this takes a community and a village of people from all different kind of walks of life and areas. Um, and I personally was really adamant that I wanted it to be no longer than 90 minutes. Now it's about an hour and 45 minutes, but you know, I felt like for this, in this particular moment and the way that we were trying to tell the story, what was going on, that it had to be concise somehow that we had to sum it up. We were never going to be able to explore all the facts of the case. We were never going to be able to get into the details of Mike Brown's death if we wanted to execute this really emotional and intimate story. So, you know, just, I, I have to thank my editor, Christopher McNabb. I mean, just a really, really brilliant and dedicated human being um, navigated through, you know, we, we researched um, so much archival, we did it really late in the process, and over 25 archival sources ended up being used. Um, so he's pulling clips from Instagram, clips from Vine, little 10 second videos, and you know, his ability to really create a sense of space out of these really disparate sources and kind of get to the heart of the emotion in these public moments. I think, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that he came to the table with that skill set, and, and you know, it was a really ex explorational process. Yeah, I, I, I want to comment on this. This is an extraordinary film, by the way. I saw it at the premiere at Sundance. Whose streets are streets? It's just it's it's an amazingly profoundly moving movie, and it's easy to miss that one of the giant differences between this and Eyes on the Prize in the, is that all the footage we had to work with with Eyes on the Prize was shot by white male camera guys from the networks working for networks in Los Angeles and um, New York. Um, I mean, there was n no individual person in Selma, Alabama, from the community had a camera shooting. Uh, they were, nobody was shooting home movies. Uh, and one of the things that's so energizing and moving about this film is that it's, it's so clearly from inside the community. And that's partly because times have changed. It's partly because everyone has cell phones now. But it's a, it's a totally different cinematic experience because it's, 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 it, it is filmed by the people about whom the film is being made. Uh, it's a totally different, yeah. Absolutely, um, which is another great segue to my uh, next question, which is your film is clearly, it, it has a sense of intimacy to it. There's no narrator, um, and I, I feel like with Eyes on the Prize episodes, there's much more of a, of a kind of a distance, and I wonder if you guys could talk about the decisions in how you chose, how you were going to tell these stories, what were some of the, the, the decisions you made about the actual filmmaking 
you made a decision. You wouldn't have a narrator. You wouldn't have a, a script, that sort of thing. And that's a huge part of Eyes on the Prize is, is this voice on high that is taking you on this journey. And as you said, uh, John, your film is very much intimate. And I wouldn't say yours isn't intimate, but it's, it's clearly a, a different aesthetic. So if you guys could talk about those decisions and why you think they were effective for the particular films that you made. Well, in the, in the case of Eyes, one of the things that was paramount in terms of us all starting this process was Henry was, and John and Judith Vecchione, the, the one word that we kept hearing all the time was you have to, the sentence was you have to tell us a story. What's the story? And how does the story unfold? And this is where, after all my years of editing, this is where I first heard someone say the three-part structure. <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to adhere to the three-part structure. And that was always a challenge. You know, I had to set up the inciting incident and the conclusion. The other thing that was important too that Henry basically said and John and Judith said to us that it's gotta be from the people who were there when you look for your interviews. They have to tell us a story, you know. And so that was another challenge. And then the, other t the third challenge was to be able to say, which really was very important from a journalistic perspective, you had to be accurate. You had to make sure all your facts checked out. You couldn't just say something because you felt you, you felt it. You had to, after we got to our cuts, our final cuts, we would go into a room with John and Judith Vecchione and the other advisors and Henry and our producing team, and we would go through every sentence of narration, every interview, and that we would have to have a Bible to fact check everything we said. If it wasn't fact checked, it wasn't gonna get in the show, you know? And the importance of Julian to this to the series, in my opinion, was to be able to, he, to, I don't think of him as a voice of God. I think of him as someone who had been a part of the movement who said, I'm gonna help set the stage and sit, let you, this story unfold. You know, and that's what his responsibility was. But it was our responsibility to write that stuff and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it so it felt right. It was always about, that's where I really understood journalistic integrity. And from making eyes on the prize. John? Well, we were, I think, I, I think I'm speaking for Sam and myself and a whole bunch of others. I think given our own w ways of doing things, all of us would have made much more bold films for eyes on the prize. I mean, it's very, very spare. It's, it's narration, interviews with people who were there, archive footage, and songs from the time. That's it, okay? It's very, very spare. I mean, we would have gone crazy. We would have done a million, we made, would have made it more like Who's Streets, right, if we could have. But uh, this was 1985, and there, were, there, was, there had never been a series about civil rights. So we were starting from scratch, and we were aiming very, very high for the breadth of our audience. Henry was really determined that 50 million Americans would see this, which in fact happened, and they'd be white and they'd be black, and they'd be blue. Most of, many of them, most of them probably never heard of Emmett Till. So there was all this historical baggage, this background. It's like doing the first film about Elvis Presley or the first film about, you know, you name it. You've got to get all this baggage out of the way. And, and I hope paved the way so you don't have to do all that when you do those films now. So that partly accounts for why it's, you know, it looks kind of clunky now. It looks like old fashioned. It is old fashioned filmmaking, but that. And, and John is absolutely right because I had come out of making documentaries that were no narration, that were really direct cinema, you know, where we would shape it with just the footage that was shot and the people that we had interviewed, and there was nobody, there was no, no Julian Bond. So my first, I, I completely in sync with John. To me, I could, what are you making these kind of films for? This is like old fashioned stuff. But this was Henry's, he wanted to make sure he got an audience to pay attention, you know. And for me, as a first-time producer, it was a big challenge to adhere to these rules. You know, I was chopping at the bit all the time. Um, yeah, I would just echo that. I mean, I think films like Eyes on the Prize, and I think specifically Eyes on the Prize, you know, laid a foundation for us. And the question that we had to grapple with was, okay, you know, this is the same story. This is a story where you know how it ends before it even starts. And so how do you 
kind of make something new, what has not been done. And so I think because Henry d approached it the way he did and because you all took those steps and because you all had that kind of rigor with the facts, it opened up a space for us to do something emotional, for us to add another element. Um, I think the, the process of kind of humanizing black people and humanizing our experience in this country has been our project since we were brought to this country. And so I think you, you should look at these films as an evolution of that attempt to engage with white America, to engage with the popular imagination, and to you know kind of fully lay claim to our humanity in all the different ways. I think that you know we think of this movement as a, as a human rights movement. We think of it as an advancement of civil rights to say that no, now it's actually time for full recognition of our humanity and all the ways that that means. Um, so yeah, I just, and, you know, again, have to thank you all for the work that you did and for, for really setting the stage and, and teaching and giving us a kind of arena to play in and learn from and bounce off and think, okay, do we want to do it like this? Do we not want to do it like this? You know, having that foundation there is really important. Well, you know that now we learn from you, right? Thank you. It's true. I mean, I think that tension is always so interesting because, um, and as, as a writer who also writes about, I call my beat the segregation beat, I write about uh, racial inequality, particularly uh, with black children, is you are trying to craft something that you hope will prod people to do the right thing, but you're also trying to be true to that story. And for me, and I imagine for you, the outrage that you feel about this injustice that you're chronicling. So I wonder, um, uh, Sabah and John, you both came out of activism, and do all of you believe that all documentaries are political? Is the first part of the question. Are all documentaries political? Um, and what is the role of documentary in social change? Yeah, I think, I think that all art is political. Um, I think if you're making a documentary that's not political, then you're just taking the political stance of neutrality. But I think, you know, it's still political, <laughs> whether you like it or not. I'm going to steal that one. I like that <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything is political. I don't think there's anything we do in our waking lives that's not political. We may not, we may not identify it as such. Now, are all documentaries films of advocacy? That's a different question. And, and I, I don't think that every documentary has to be a film of advocacy. And in fact, I've been, I've been troubled in the last 10 years when we started to have all these metrics for, from funders about, you know, when you do a documentary, can you point to how many clicks were on the website to support that NGO? I think that, that limits what we do. I think there are some documentaries that are not, there should be plenty of documentaries that are not overt advocacy. Um, I'll, I have to follow up also with what Sam said, that it was at Blackside that I learned that you have to be factual. I mean, you have to, if the, Henry used to say, if the film's gonna get attacked, let's have it attacked for the right reasons, not because you stole a close up from some meeting and put it in a meeting 100 miles away on a different day. Let's just don't do that. Um, and I've carried that with me. And that's sometimes hard because it sometimes results in, what do they call it, testimony against interest. You know, sometimes it makes your guys your eyes don't look so great, but you know, so be it. I am on the same page as Sabah. All art is political, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, as soon as you shape something, as soon as you say something, you're making a political stance. The thing is, is if, if you are aware of it, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a young editor, when I first started in the business, I said to, Anybody who could hear me when I was 23, 24, I said, I don't want to make any political films. I don't want to make any films associated with black people. I want to make films just about people. You know, well, that was a political stance. <laughs> and then I was very fortunate about five years later to meet a filmmaker named St. Clair Bourne, wonderful documentarian, right? And St. made me understand that all art is political. And from that point on, <laughs> that was, that's my mantra. <laughs> and I would just add for the second part of your question, um, you know, what is the importance of, of documentary? I think spaces like this really demonstrate that. And I think one of the things that we thought about as we were creating Who Streets is we did want a theatrical release. I really wanted for this film 
to be exposed on the level of mainstream media communication because that is how kind of the alternative story was, you know, the alternative facts were presented. And it, it seemed like to set the record straight that it needed to go to that level. And I also just think, you know, with film, I think a lot of the magic of it comes when you get to enjoy it in a room with a bunch of other people and you can feel the palpable energy and you laugh together and you cry together and you, you know, gasp and all of that. And I think documentary, um, you know, I think that, again, the work that you all have done, the groundwork you have laid with this medium, or particularly with Eyes on the Prize and, you know, civil rights films that were extremely rigorous and breaking down and laying out, you know, it's all there. I think it gives filmmakers now license to really create documentaries that are experiences that can open people's eyes and, you know, I, I think of it as one of the few ways that we actually have to kind of combat segregation because segregation never really, really stopped. And I think these are some of the few moments when we actually come face to face with one another. Um, so I think that's, that for me would be the importance of documentary to activism. Great. So I think we have a few minutes for uh, question and answer. So there's a microphone on both sides of the room if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. Hey, Barbara. Hey, Nicole, hi. Um, thanks for this, it's been really interesting. And um, I just wanna actually make two observations for comment by anybody who might wish to. Um, one is that I, I've seen this, I saw Eyes on the Prize originally, and it's nice to see it again, but one of the things that I was really struck by, and I think it follows up on um, something you guys were talking about with respect to all the different ways that people now have cameras and they document things in real time. But given where we are right now, where we're just, that has had tremendous power in our culture. I was stunned to realize that when those camera people were there, I wanna say cameramen, because they probably were men, from the big networks with those network logos on their cameras, law enforcement is, it's not that they're not aware they're there, they're all over the place, we can see them, and seem to not understand that what they were doing, the power of the visual that was being captured as they were doing it. I was just very struck by how, I don't know if, I don't, I wanna say oblivious they were to it, but they couldn't have been oblivious to the cameras, but they were absolutely oblivious to what the impact of that could potentially be. So that was just one observation I wanted to make. And then the second thing I wanted to say is, um, I really appreciate this series because in the um, fall of 1964, I was starting kindergarten at a school that no longer exists. It was kind of an alternative school called the Walden School on West 88th Street. And the, I think it was the first day of kindergarten. The whole school, we had an assembly and we learned about um, the killings in Mississippi in 1964 because Andy Goodman had graduated from Walden. And the community was a very, the Walden community was a very tight community. And so I think this is what we did on the first day of, I was five years old and I remember this distinctly. And then we all went outside and all of us kids uh, helped to plant what is still there. It is still there on 88th and Central Park West, a tree called the Andrew Goodman tree, and it's got a little plaque, and if you walk by 88th Street and you just turn the corner, uh, you'll see it. And it wasn't until, so I always knew this story about Andy Goodman, but it wasn't until I really, I saw this series that I really had a much bigger understanding of like Freedom Summer, and um, what this little story that had a big impact on me as a little kid, like what the bigger thing was. So I know neither of those were questions, but I just wanted to pass those two things along. There are any other questions from the audience? If not, I have, do you wanna to go to the microphone? I have a question for Sam. Hey, Hi. Um, would you mind talking a little bit more about the process of Henry Hampton? Because he, he's at the root of all this. If, um, you say, tell the story. And I remember that he, he who has pushed people, pushed you and other producers, push the envelope. You, if you'd come up with a, a concept, 
he had an instinct. He was not the most, as I remember, articulate person in the room, but he has an instinct to turn down all the solutions you came up with, and he, he, he was quasi almost right in the end. And the language that looks old fashioned, I think it's not, it's less a, a white language than the PBS language that was prevalent, like middle of the road. You had to be middle of the road, show both sides, yeah. which I is. I all the time. Yeah. I, I gotta say to you that you're right. We, we would present him with different approaches and concepts and he would shoot them down. And Sheila and I would, and the other producers, Jackie and Louie, you know, we would get frustrated. And the first thing we would do, in all honesty, we'd go call John. We said, John, we need help. <laughs> we did it all the time. Because we were always like dizzy. Because we said, where are we going? Because we would pitch and pitch and pitch. And Henry would just like shoot us down. And I'd say, John, we need help. <laughs> For those of you who are filmmakers, next time you're, you're in a, a production meeting and you just can't figure out what, what's going on, remember this, that I would very, I lived in California, I was commuting from California, and I would very often get phone calls from a producer who had just been in a meeting with Henry Hampton. I was 3,000 miles away and the producer would say, what did Henry mean in that meeting? And I would say, I have no idea, you know, I wasn't there. And then five minutes later, I'd get a call from another producer who'd been in the same meeting and say, what did Henry mean? So it was my job to try to, then I'd have to call Henry, figure out what he meant, and then I'd call the producers back. So I was kind of the translator, uh, you know, but these, you know. I, he, he, you know, he, he had a vision. You know, I always say this, I, I, I always say, and this, I'm very honest, Henry to me wasn't a filmmaker, he was a visionary. And he was a visionary that sometimes didn't quite know how to articulate the vision to us, but if you stayed at the table long enough and you went to Jimmy DeVecchione and John, it, you would, it would come around. Because I, I have to say that as a first time producer, coming from it as an editor, I thought I knew everything. I thought I knew better than any producer, <laughs> you know. But I learned a valuable lesson that just because I was editing all this footage didn't mean I knew how to be a producer. And that's one of the most invaluable things I learned from the Eyes on the Prize experience how to be a producer. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead. I think that, that me seeing some of Eyes on the Prize right now is so important because um, none of us have talked about the elephant in the room, but what just happened with that election, seeing where we came from in that detail, especially about the hatreds and the racism and the sexism of our country, it's important because I, I was blindsided. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I was by what happened, but in context, you know, when you start seeing it, you realize, no, this, this, unfortunately, it is who we are, and we're trying to be better. And sometimes it goes back and forth, and I think we're in the back, but it, it, it at least gives a context that's so important to, to be able to understand what happened. So well, what's, for what's so interesting about that, and and and. You're making your film under President Obama, right? And I think what was important to remember is, yes, an election it was a manifestation of clearly the tensions and the bigotry that already existed. And so, yeah, I guess as a wrap-up question, I would uh, be interested to know what, what has that felt like? Because I feel, I get that a lot with my work too, where people are like, oh my God, what's gonna happen under Trump? And I'm like, I've been writing about really bad stuff for eight years of the Obama administration, and clearly it can get worse, but it's almost like we, we want to be let off the hook by saying that the election of Trump was not who we are. Um, and so we have to ignore what was happening when you were making a film just a couple years ago. Right, um, <clears throat> you know, ha having the first black president, I remember when Obama was elected and I had just, I missed the cutoff to vote in his first election by a couple of months. Um, but, you know, there was just this overwhelming feeling. I was back home in LA at the time and everybody had just come out onto the streets and were honking and crying and just, you know, it felt like we had won this amazing victory. We had finally had a black person, you know, in the White House, not the help. Um, and, you know, and so I take that victory because that is amazing. And to have him and to have Michelle, I think really it's about Michelle, let's be oh honest. Um, <laughs> 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 
you know, but to have those figures, it means something to us, you know, and it is an honor to have that office and, and to, to run this country. But at the same time, you know, across the board, a lot of the things that happened under his administration were the worst of the things that have been happening under president after president, as far as, you know, the drone policies overseas, as far as, you know, what was happening in Ferguson and St. Louis and the lack of intervention there. And so I have always been um, critical, and I think it is important to constantly be critical of whoever is in office, you know. We should respect and honor our leaders, but at the same time, it doesn't serve anyone to not be critical of them just because maybe we like them or they make us feel good that they're, that they're there. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really, really important to look at the situation we find ourselves in now as a culmination of all of these different, you know, politics and things that have been happening. I don't see it as us going backwards. I see it as more of an eruption of a building energy, um, you know, and it, it gets really complicated where all those things come from. But I think that overall, I would say this isn't, I don't know, they, like we were saying, you know, back in the room, there do there does feel like there are things happening that are unprecedented, but there are also things happening that have been happening that we're just starting to look at. Did you want to add something, Sam? Yeah, to me, what's happening is historical precedent about precedent about what America is. I mean, you think back historically, go back to Civil War, slaves are free, Reconstruction, wow, great things, bang, Reconstruction's Jim over, Jim Crow. This is just a cycle. This is America, you know? And the challenge for us as documentary filmmakers are to do films, to be involved in documentaries that challenge this, constantly challenge this, you know? Because this, to me, is America. <laughs> I mean, the power of these, t these films together, Eyes on the Prize and Who's Streets, is you see how secular it all is. You see, the, you see the police standing off against peaceful protesters in Selma and in Birmingham, and then you see that happening again in Ferguson. And I think that is where, um, I mean, civil rights movements, I always understand it is the ability for film to bear witness and to expose what, in a segregated society, white Americans don't have to see. What you were seeing, right, in all of these places without film, booming this into people's homes or bringing it into theaters has allowed many Americans to ignore the reality on the ground. And I think you guys have all done that so powerfully. Um, is it time to wrap up? Okay. So uh, I think, what time are they screening? Streets. Whose Streets is next? Okay. I thought they were filming your film. Oh. Sorry, so Who's Streets will be um, in theaters this summer. It's going to be distributed by Magnolia Pictures. Actually, if you go to see I Am Not Your Negro next weekend, starting next weekend, you can catch a little teaser um, of Who's Streets. And um, we'll be at different festivals. I think we'll be back here, back in Brooklyn at BAM in a couple of months. So. And I'm just going to say, I just had a show come on Monday on PBS called The Talk, Race in America. And, and you can stream it at pbs.org. Do you want to plug, say, I just plug anything book. too? You can buy it out <laughs> in the lobby. Yes. So I'll sign it. So thank you all for, it's been an honor to be on the, the stage with all three of you um, and the work that you guys are doing and have done is so powerful. So if we could show our appreciation, thank you. Thank you.